Hello, my loves. Today, I had planned to read this with you uh, about how diamonds are formed. Um, so I wrote this in my lesson plans, but then something happened that made me change my mind. So I still want you to read this article, but you can read it on your own. You can press, press the play button. It can read it with you. But I wanted to talk about a difference. Um, well, I guess kind of a different treasure, if you will. This is a treasure that you can also find in the ground. The difference is the treasure I want to talk to you about is super important and very, very useful and uh, can be extremely beautiful, just like a diamond. And um, the reason why I thought I wanted to share it with you is because of my cat. <laughs> my cat, um, it's actually Mr. Mistopheles. He came home the other day, and now he's normally a tuxedo cat, so he's black and white. And he came home and he was orange and black. And he was orange from, you know, the, the orange clay of like a baseball field. So I'm thinking that's what it's from because they're doing a little construction uh, a couple blocks away. And I mean, we wiped him off and, and, you know, we got most of it off. And then he comes back the next day and he's orange again. <laughs> so I figured if I'm allowed to dye my hair red, he's allowed to dye his fur orange. But it got me thinking about the, the really cool stuff that, that clay can be made into. So for example, here, one of my favorite types of architecture is Adobe. And Adobe architecture, you see how it's kind of like square, but a little bit rounded. It's because this is made from clay. It's almost like a giant building made of Play-Doh. It's really amazing. And what's fantastic about this is the clay comes right from the ground. And um, <clears throat> the clay, uh, usually you'll find Adobe homes in places like um, California, you'll find them in Florida. We've got them here in Florida and um, New Mexico and places like that where it's really hot and dry and places that don't often get too much rain. Now we do get a lot of rain in Florida. That's why we don't have too many Adobe homes nowadays because when you have lots of rain, it'll erode and, and weather and erode the Adobe home. And you have to constantly, you know, repair it. In a, in a dry, arid place like New Mexico, they don't have that problem. So these um, adobe homes will last for thousands and thousands of years in those kinds of climates. Mexico as well, yes, of course. So I do absolutely love this style of building, but I really like the fact that these are mud homes. They're built from materials we get out of the ground. So they're from the earth. They're earth friendly. They're not harmful to the environment because they come from the environment. And um, the really cool thing is that these were, were originally rocks. They were a, originally, um, yeah, my brain just stopped. The rocks that form from the heat, igneous rocks. And those igneous rocks get weathered and the weathering and they mix with some water and they they flow and settle kind of in streams and in watery areas and they form clay and you guys have worked with clay before so i have a video that i found because like i said this just popped into my head and i was so interested and i wanted to share some things that i found with you and this is what science is all about it's about, you know, adding to the information that you have or finding something that you're interested in and researching it and learning about it. All right, so the title of this is Ceramics, Making Clay and Pottery. But I'm just gonna show you the first part of this video because I want you to see how the artist in this video makes the clay.
going to pause and I want to rewind for a second. There, that was the perfect spot. This is so interesting. He came knowing that he was going to collect this material from the ground. And instead of bringing like a hammer or a chisel or something sharp, he just grabbed a couple of rocks and he's using the tools that he found in the environment to help him collect this. I thought that was really cool. Okay. Oh, so what's happening here? Okay, he's making a mess. <laughs> That's awesome. But these rocks are actually breaking up and they are dissolving into that water. And that's what's special about clay. Other rocks will, you know, stay as a rock, but the clay is actually tiny particles. Oh, that looks so neat. Why do you think he's doing this? He could just go to the store and buy clay. Well, it doesn't look like clay that I know. What do you think is the next step? I'm gonna pause it right there and scooch back, scooch back. Okay, here. So what he's doing with the cup is as that, uh, as the sediment settles down to the bottom of the buckets, the water is coming up to the top. So he's scooping, he's gently scooping off the water off the top. And that way what he leaves behind is the sediment is that um, those particles of clay. Now he's only doing it for a few seconds in the video, but he will continue to do it until almost all of that water is gone. It looks a little too wet to be clay, huh? What do you think the next step is now? Like mustard. <laughs> Why do you think he took it out of the bucket and then and he looks like he's spreading it thin? Oh, wow, wow, look how, how much drier it is since he spread it thin. Have you noticed that when you spread things thin, they'll dry out faster? Okay, what does this say? This here is my second time ever, my second time ever time ever throwing clay. Don't try to learn from the way I'm doing it since I'm making a lot of mistakes. Oh, okay, so he's telling you that, you know, he's, he's learning as he goes, so don't use this video as like, you know, a how-to video. This is more, instead of an educational video, it's more like an interest video. I'm really interested in how he made his own clay.
and it looks super messy. Look how gloopy his hands are. Oh my goodness. Okay, the next day I watched some videos and it helped me a lot with centering the clay because you definitely want that on the center. Okay, so he's learning from others. And look, I see he's wearing a towel on this day to protect his clothes. And thank goodness, look at the mess. Oh, I definitely want to try this. The clay's too hard and he had to apply a lot of pressure. What do you think he could do to soften that clay up a bit? Wow, they came out pretty good, I like those. All right, after I was done with the second piece, I took the clay, poked a bunch of holes in it, and filled them with water. I then let it sit the night over. So he let it sit overnight. He wants that clay to soften up, to soak in that water. I really like that he's not giving up and he didn't just run to the store and buy clay. I like that he's trying again. He's trying to solve the problem. Okay, new towel, new mess. a different experience just because the clay had a different texture. Awesome. Okay, so he's really problem solving there. I think that's amazing. There is... Another video I want to show you. And this was called Earth and Fire, Anasazi Style Pottery.
enjoyed that video. I thought that was fabulous. So what was really cool is she grabbed her own clay. She created her own clay right here. Here's pieces of clay. Now this is sedimentary rock and you know sedimentary rock can break apart pretty easily and one of the characteristics of clay is that the particles are so teeny, teeny, tiny that they, they feel kind of very smooth, almost like a solid rock, but they really just crumble up. And what she had done here, so you see, she's adding the water to moisten that clay, but now she's breaking up other pieces of rock because when you add sand to that clay it helps reduce the amount of shrinkage when it dries because clay wants to expand when it's wet and shrinks when it's dry but when you add that sand it it helps it kind of stay in one place so she's mixing it together she's forming her pottery and here She's using that rock to smooth that edge. And now she's building her fire because she has to fire her pottery to make sure that it's really super hard and dry. First, she has to make sure the pottery is completely dry. So she's gotta wait, you know, maybe two days and then she has to fire it. This was neat. This little part, she's making her own paintbrush. See, did I go too far? There it is. She's making her own paintbrush, and then she's using that paintbrush to paint images on the pottery. And these, these are traditional styles of the Anasazi people. Um, and they're here in North America, or they were here in North America. And then she's going to fire them again. That first firing was to make sure that they're really dry. And the second firing she did after she decorated them. And here she's throwing that sand over top because this second firing is going to take a long time. And she showed that in the video with this image, just her relaxing because there's nothing left for her to do. And now she's digging it out of the sand. And you can see where the fire was a little bit hotter here than it was there. And she's washing that. And there you go. 
this is fantastic. This is so absolutely beautiful. Okay, so we know that clay can be used for homes. We know clay can be used for pottery. Uh, clay can be used in baseball fields, as I found out with my cat. Um, clay can actually, some people even use clay as a, a type of medicine. There are so many things that clay can be used for. And I wanna show you one more. Eighteenth century cooking. What do you think the clay is going to be used for here in this video? What kinds of uses would we have with cooking for clay? Well, in the last video, we saw how she made like little pots and bowls and things like that. Hmm, well, let's see. <laughs> In this video, we're going to show you how to build an earthen oven. Cool. The existence of ovens like this uh, is easily documented for the 18th century. In fact, just about every ancient culture had a very similar oven. There's one particular woodcut illustration from medieval times depicting an earthen oven built on a wagon. There are references in 18th century literature uh, and also archaeological evidence that you would find ovens like this in private homes and uh, in fort settings. There are also references to communal ovens where the baker would bake bread for an entire village. We're going to need... Okay, so in a lot of villages you will actually find just one central oven and often in the middle of the village in like the middle of a little town and the reason is because these ovens don't actually cook uh, the bread with the fire. You build the fire inside the oven, then you scoop the fire out. And the heat that has soaked into the brick, into that, um, into that clay oven, the heat is what's cooking your bread. So it takes a lot of fire, it takes a lot of fuel, and a lot of time to heat that oven up. And then it's going to take a very long time, sometimes even days, for that oven to cool down. Well, why waste all of that energy? So they would fire up that oven, and people throughout the village or throughout the town would be there ready to throw their bread in. So they'd make their, their bread, and they'd walk it down Main Street, and they'd all cook it either at the same time or they'd take turns. So that kind of stuff we see in history, but now we're gonna see how one of those ovens is made. Several things to make our mud oven out of. We're going to need sand. That's the uh, major component of our uh, oven. We're going to need a good bit of clay. This is dried clay you can get at a masonry store, or you can get a damp clay out of a ditch bank. We're going to need straw or dried grass or um, uh, maybe hay. We may need some bricks, so some fire bricks, even, even regular bricks will work. And you're going to need a canvas tarp to mix your cob together with, and you're definitely going to need a good bit of water. Before you build your oven, you have to consider what you're going to build your oven on. There are historical examples of uh, ovens built on tables or on brick or stone uh, plinths on ards. On the top of our very sturdy table, we've laid out a layer of firebrick. That's going to be the floor of our oven. We've also chalked out here the design, about 22 inches across at the bottom on the inside. That's the inside measurement. It's going to be, the walls are going to be about six inches thick. So we've got markings here so we can see about how big it's going to look on the surface. The uh, door width right here is about 12 inches across so we can get something as big as a pie in without too much trouble. First thing we're going to do is we're going to build the core. It's going to be like a sandcastle, just wet sand that we're going to build the oven over the top of. Sometimes you'll see other people doing it with sticks and things like this. This is going to be much easier and quicker. We've got, this is where our door is going to be. I just went ahead and put a couple bricks in here to be the inner core of the door. They'll be removed. Um, and right here I've, I've placed a brick wall 
to uh, give us a nice flat surface to build up against. So we've taken about an hour to put this together. We've used very wet sand so that it stays into shape. And we've got to make sure that this stays wet till we get our first layer on it. There aren't very many critical things about the shape and the size of your particular oven, but there is one critical thing, and that is the height of the opening tunnel here compared to the height of your dome. Uh, these need to be a particular ratio or else the air won't draw through this when you're uh, burning uh, the wood inside of the thing. So this is a, a between 65 and 60 percent or about 63 percent height here compared to the height there. The next thing. All right, I'm going to pause. This is at 323. Remind me so we can go right back there. 323, okay, there, uh, where is that little guy? There he is, okay. Okay, so here, what do you notice? What is that? Yeah, this is, a, it's a clay pitcher. This is made out of clay. Yes, and then all of these bricks are made out of clay. And you can even see um, another pitcher of water, a vessel of water made out of, yep, it's made out of clay. So clay is super useful. So there's, there's a close-up of that picture. Look how beautiful that is. ...of your particular oven, but there is one critical thing, and that is the height of the opening tunnel here compared to the height of your dome. Uh, these need to be a particular ratio or else the air won't draw through this when you're uh, burning uh, the wood inside of the thing. So this is a, a between 65 and 60% or about 63% height here compared to the height there. The next thing we're gonna do is put paper on this. We're gonna put paper, we're gonna wet it down so it'll give us a layer to separate. So when we take the uh, sand out, uh, it doesn't stick to the inner surface. We've got the uh, paper covering done on our uh, sand inner core. This will make it much easier to uh, take the uh, core out from underneath it. Uh, now it's time to make the uh, first layer of cob or mud to put on our oven. This innermost layer of mud or, or cob that we're going to put on our oven is just sand and clay. Uh, about two parts sand to one part clay. We mix those two together so that they're very well mixed and then we just uh, put it on there. We want, want to make sure it's about, got about the right consistency that we can still work it, but it isn't so wet that it's sloppy. Um, and you want to make sure to have uh, air on the side of a little more sand than too much clay. The more clay you've got, the more it's going to shrink and crack. So you probably want to make up a bunch of this cob beforehand. Uh, it ages well, it won't, it won't go bad waiting overnight. And that way, as soon as you're done with your sandcastle core, you can start putting it on right away and you don't have to worry about that drying out and blowing away while you're making your cob. So learning just the right consistency, that can be a trick. As you see here, I've been stomping on this pile for a little while. This is starting to feel really good. It forms up into a, a, a ball, like a snowball. It doesn't deform easily. It's not sloppy. You still form it into uh, any shape you want, and it's not too uh, drippy either. That's what you're looking for, something that holds together well, but still moldable. So we're working on putting this first layer on. This is a, a layer without any straw in it because that would just burn up anyway. It's about three inches thick, and we're starting at the very bottom. We're gonna work our way up. That way we can watch as we go to make sure our thickness stays about the same. Well, we finished the, uh, the inner mud layer yesterday afternoon, and we let this set overnight, and it's, uh, it's just slightly firmer than it was. We don't want to let it get too dry or else the next layer won't adhere to this layer properly. We've uh, scratched this layer a little bit so that the uh, next layer of cob we put on here will adhere nicely. This next layer of cob that we put on, it's going to have uh, grass or hay or straw in it to give it a lot more strength 
than this inner layer. We're gonna mix our clay and our sand first. As soon as that's getting close to the right consistency, that's when we'll add our other uh, binder material here. So, I've got this mixed up. I'm gonna uh, mix this up just slightly wetter. Uh, it's feeling a, a, like a pretty good consistency now under my feet. And since, well, since we're gonna add in this dry straw here, it's gonna dry it up a little bit. So I'm gonna start with a slightly wetter uh, mixture. But we wanted to get this mixed first and then add in the binder. This will add some amazing strength to it. When it dries up, it really binds it together. So it's helpful to make this cob up beforehand. Uh, it really makes it work better if it's a couple days old, but you don't want to let it get too old because as it's uh, wet for a long time, the grass will start to rot in there. So you don't want that to happen. If it's a day or two old, keep it wrapped in plastic so it's wet and pliable. It'll really work even better after a day or two. So to make this go faster, I suggest you invite a bunch of friends over. Have a cob party. They can be stomping on this stuff while you're putting it on your stove. Everyone will have fun. Well, I've got about uh, five or six uh, loaves of, uh, big loaves of, of cob here ready to go. I think that's a good start. I'm not sure exactly how many it's gonna take to cover this oven, so we're gonna uh, put this on, and then I'll see how much more I need to make. I've got uh, marks here on the table to uh, get about uh, two and a half or three inches for the outside layer. We're gonna start putting on our loaves. We're gonna make sure that they butt up well with the uh, inner core here, so there's a uh, big airspace between them. And I'll just start adding these on all the way around. There it is, we've got the second uh, layer of a uh, cob type material on here. This is the stuff with the straw that's, that's built into it. Uh, it does, as you work it, it kind of sags down some. So you might want to start a little thinner at the bottom than the finish, expecting some of it to sag down into position a little bit. This gives us a good opportunity to look at the cross section about what's going on here. You can see the cob's a little thicker down at the bottom than it is at the top because it's kind of sagged a little bit. You can see our outer cob core, our inner core that uh, doesn't have this straw in it. And here's the, the sand core on the inside. We're going to add um, a little bit to the outside here. We're going to give it a nice rounded opening because a rounded opening is going to have more strength than this uh, sharp edge. Well, we've uh, finished putting our rounded opening on the oven, so it'll be a, a, a little bit stronger. We made sure to, to uh, uh, mate the, the, the cob that we added back into this other stuff. Whenever you add two pieces together, you really have to work it so that the two pieces adhere to each other and it just doesn't fall off. We added a little bit of sand on the front uh, to help support that lip. Um, depending on where you're at, your environment, the time of year, uh, what the humidity is, this will take two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, maybe even a little longer for it to get dry enough uh, for it to even start to even think about warming it up from the inside. While this is drying, you don't want to, to get it rained on. So you're gonna need to protect this from the weather, but don't uh, cover it with plastic so that it can't dry. So you wanna protect it from the rain, but let it breathe. So it's only been about 24 hours since we've been here last, but it's uh, firmed up enough with uh, how the weather is here that we were able to go ahead and pull out some of the sand. I haven't gone and dug the whole thing out, but I want to let it uh, start to dry out on the inside and even peel off some of the paper if you want to, but that'll all burn out anyway. But we just uh, dug it out about halfway. We'll come back in a couple more days, take out more. We've removed the sand core from this oven and we've given it a couple weeks to dry, so it's almost ready to fire. You may not have to wait this long if you build an oven, but if it's not adequately dry before you fire it, it'll cause cracking 
or at least more cracking than normal in the body. Even if you wait like we did, uh, it's inevitable that some cracking will occur. Don't be alarmed. If the cracks are especially big, you can repair them with a little extra sand and clay and let that dry in place. We've employed a few warming fires in this oven and it's, and it's dried out well. We've gotten a few cracks, but overall we're really pleased. The walls of this oven are extremely durable. Here's a, a brick of the material and it takes a lot to uh, break this material up. So if you need to do modifications, you'll really have to chop and add it. Um, however, is as sturdy as this is, it still needs to be protected from the weather. This is water soluble and it'll just wash away with the rain. So we need this to last a while. We're gonna have to build a little roof over it. Make sure to watch part two of this video where we uh, learn how to bake bread in one of these earthen ovens. You know, this looks pretty good. I think I'm gonna fire that. <laughs>enjoyed those videos as much as I did. Um, so now would be the time for you to go on over and if you haven't already read about diamonds and finished those articles, now's the time to do it. Um, we've got today and tomorrow left to do studies weekly. Next week, I am not assigning any studies weekly. Um, and next week, what I have planned is a, uh, a Disney activity where you kind of create your own Disney theme park. And I know you guys are doing something similar uh, with Miss Hodges. If you have a lot to catch up on with your iReady math, then you know what, by all means, skip this activity and catch up with iReady math. Because that's going to be really important because those are your grades. If you are caught up with iReady Math and you just don't want to do that activity, you know what, that's okay too. You know, take a break, maybe catch up with uh, something else of Ms. Hodges, maybe do some of those extra credit activities for, uh, for science because it's never too late to get that done. But next week is a makeup week. So anything that you haven't finished up, you're going to be able to do, uh, to have some extra time with that next week. Um, and I will see you later. Okay. I love you guys. Bye.